Devin Binder, it's really a pleasure to be, uh, to be here. I want to thank Dr. Duane, uh, my colleague Dr. Pathak, I work with in Orange County and the organizers here. Um, I'm a neurosurgeon and I'm very uh, dedicated to uh, deep brain stimulation. I've had an interest in this for some time and I'm, I'm going to overwhelm you with detail. Uh, I promise to do that. And um, yet I want to, uh, uh, whatever sticks out of all the studies and the data that I provide you, I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions, both at the um, at the panel session, but also um, I can be reached by email through my website, which is listed at the bottom here. I have an academic affiliation with UC Riverside, and I teach in the UC Riverside uh, program in uh, biomedical sciences, <clears throat> in addition to my um, clinical practice in Orange County. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about DBS for dystonia. Obviously, cervical dystonia, spasmodic torticollis, is what we're here to talk about today, and I'm going to come back to that. But there's a lot of literature on DBS for dystonia uh, that l largely started with generalized dystonias. And then more recent literature has talked about cervical dystonia. So I want to give you the background on how DBS works or how it's thought to work, um, the procedure itself, the risks and benefits, and then uh, coming to the studies on the twister scale and all these other things that are mo much more recent and very exciting with respect to uh, DBS for cervical dystonia. Um, I'm going to run through these introductory slides relatively fast, both because most people here are very familiar with this, and also because some of this relates more to generalized dystonia. Um, but uh, dystonia is uh, the third most common movement disorder, and it of course involves involuntary muscle contractions producing painful postures and, and or twisting and writhing movements. Um, in uh, the case of cervical dystonia, obviously it's the neck, and other case, uh, cases of uh, segment, uh, segmental dystonia affecting other parts of the body can affect other parts of the body, or it can be generalized. What's important for the targets that we're going to talk about, and uh, Dr. Pathak mentioned this uh, briefly in his uh, anatomy uh, diagrams, is that um, a lot of the abnormalities uh, with respect to um, the, the dystonia are thought to arise in what's called the extrapyramidal movement disorder system. And I'm going to describe that in some detail because that leads to um, the targets that we use for uh, DBS. And the basal ganglia, which is this group of structures Dr. Pathak mentioned, these nuts and berries, I think he called them, which I'll, I'll describe in detail, um, are thought to be involved in what's called scaling or focusing of movement. So selecting specific muscles to activate uh, through the brain pathways while suppressing antagonist muscles. And if you have co-contraction, an abnormal co-contraction of muscles or an abnormal contraction of a given muscle, uh, then that can lead to, to these uh, symptoms of dystonia. So uh, as you know, there's many types of um, dystonia and uh, uh, both uh, in, in many different etiologies, in other words, causes, uh, both uh, genetic and, and, um, and other. Uh, secondary causes uh, include things like stroke, trauma, uh, cerebral palsy, uh, drugs, and uh, I think as Dr. Pathak mentioned, tardive dystonia is one of the conditions that's also been treated with DBS, and that's um, drug-induced dystonias. Um, age of onset obviously differs greatly and affects uh, the co concept of whether surgical treatment should even be considered. Uh, body distribution, of course, uh, focal, multifocal, segmental, hemidystonia, meaning half the body, and uh, generalized dystonia. I'm going to skip this, obviously, that's just the genetic forms of dystonia, just to make the point that some of these genetic forms of dystonia, in particular, what's called the DOIT1 uh, positive form of, dy of generalized dystonia, has been effectively treated with, uh, with DDS. Um, clearly, um, the, the, this uh, symposium is focused on spasmodic uh, torticollis, but I just wanted to give you the, the overview that actually DBS has been used um, largely uh, in the early studies, at least in uh, generalized dystonia, um, in the DYT1 uh, uh, positive patient population that I mentioned. Um, but increasingly, DBS is being used in cervical dystonia, which of course we'll talk about. Um, and it's even been used in writer's cramp uh, in, uh, and in some of these other syndromes, such as uh, uh, Mays syndrome. So, uh, as has been described uh, much, uh, with much more expertise by my medical colleagues in this symposium, the uh, treatment uh, of a focal or segmental dystonia, such as uh, torticollis, is largely uh, with intramuscular botulinum toxin injections, and that's uh, been described and will be described in, in great detail. With, um, that's true for focal and segmental dystonias. What's interesting, of course, with generalized dystonias, which is um, a whole other uh, can of worms, so to speak, uh, there's no really great way to inject, obviously, every muscle in the body with botulinum toxin. Uh, 
So um, there's been uh, medical treatment, as has been indicated, uh, but uh, there's no great treatment for those patients. And that's DBS has had much of its impact in that group so far. Uh, there have been other procedures. I just want to take my hat off to the 50 plus years of history of these procedures. Uh, although we're pretty much focused on DBS, both today and also uh, in, in general in modern neurosurgery, we're focused on DBS as opposed to lesioning procedures. There's been a whole huge fascinating literature and, and history on actual procedures to lesion areas of the brain, um, such as palatal and thalamic lesions. And um, there's also still, as my, the, my colleague who will follow me will describe in detail, the innervation procedures, which are very uh, often very effective. But um, I'm going to talk about, of course, deep brain stimulation. What is uh, deep brain stimulation? So um, the concept is that a thin metal electrode is placed into a deep uh, brain structure. Uh, and this is almost always placed on both sides of the brain for uh, dystonia. In cases of tremor and Parkinson's disease, it's sometimes placed on one side to control symptoms on the other side of the body. The left brain controls the right body and vice versa. Uh, but in the case of dystonia, it's always, um, almost always uh, you know, uh, excuse me, bilateral placement of the electrodes. The electrode is then attached to a computerized pulse generator, essentially a pacemaker, which is placed most often in the upper chest under the skin, as is that indicated here. And then the art of DBS, uh, in addition to the surgical um, expertise of just being able to put it in the right place, which is my job, the art of it relates to the adjustment of the stimulation in the neurologist's office. And so my neurology colleagues uh, will um, use the um, stimulator programmer in the office, and I'll come back to that in some detail to um, minimize the symptoms uh, of DBS and the idea being not to create side effects with stimulation. The DBS itself reversibly alters the function of the brain tissue in the region of the stimulating electrode. So a lot matters in terms of exactly placing it in the right place, which is, as I say, my job. But secondly, um, exactly what stimulation parameters are used in the region of the electrode. The components of the DBS system, and I should mention I have no financial relationship with any of the manufacturers. The components of the DBS system um, include really, really, as I describe it, three components. One is the electrode itself, which is a thin wire going into the brain. And the second is what you might call an extension cable uh, or lead extender. And then the third is the uh, battery or plantable pulse generator itself. The, um, there's some interesting details in terms of the electrode. There's usually uh, there are four contacts on the tip of the electrode. And the neurologist uh, can use in the office any combination of those contract, contacts. They're called 0, 1, 2, and 3. So you can do 0 to 1, 0 to 2, 0 to 3, 1 to 3, etc. And there's actually multiple ways to choose the contacts that may be most uh, beneficial to the individual patient. This is just a broad overview. You can answer more questions later as you have them. Um, this is my sort of detailed anatomy slide. I don't want to go through this in great detail other than to mention that there's really complicated anatomic structures that are subserving movement. And there have been a variety of targets for uh, deep brain stimulation. So for Parkinson's disease, uh, it's, it's been uh, the sub, so-called subthalamic nucleus and the internal segment of the globus pallidus, which is this little purple triangle here. So these two structures, which actually lie uh, across each other from what's called the internal capsule in the middle, which is this big white matter pathway that goes, the cable's going down towards the spinal cord. Um, Parkinson's disease patients have benefited from DBS in the so-called STN and also in the GPI. The target for dystonia has largely been the uh, GPI, although interestingly there are some studies coming out on the STN that's very new. But for dystonia, it's been largely this target, which is uh, shown here, uh, the GPI. There's a complicated um, uh, an anatomy of this whole area where different pathways are connected to different areas. The concept is that in the correct situation where the electrode is in the uh, globus pallidus internal segment, that, that's the treatment for dystonia, interrupts some of these abnormal uh, motor outputs of the basal ganglia. I should mention for patients with essential tremor, which is the other main movement disorder that has been treated with deep brain stimulation, uh, the target is the thalamus, which is uh, this structure up here. So I want to go through a typical, uh, the stages of a typical procedure uh, for deep brain stimulation and essentially the nuts and bolts of how the procedure goes. Uh, 
Um, and this differs slightly based on each center, but uh, most of these components are there in, the, in a similar order. So most important uh, preoperative thing is to get an MRI scan, and this is not your standard MRI. This is actually a detailed MRI with very specific sequences, because with very good modern MRI, we can actually see the globus pallidus internal segment, the GPI, which is the target on the MRI images, and that's very, very helpful in terms of uh, finding uh, the structure, uh, obviously, in the operating room. What then happens is that MRI scan is actually uploaded onto a intraoperative workstation that we use to, um, to target uh, the structure in, inside the operating room. The patient comes in the morning of the procedure. Intravenous lines are placed. They're placed under station. They're not in any pain. This is obviously one of the big issues is to make sure people are extremely comfortable and that's our 100% dedication that they're completely comfortable throughout this procedure. A lot of people are, are afraid of this frame being placed on their head, which is temporary and during the procedure. Um, um, the good news is with good anesthesia uh, and with good uh, putting local anesthetic in at all the sites where the frame contacts the head, this is not painful. So the stereotactic frame, which is, which is this one uh, pictured here, there's a couple types in, uh, of, of stereotactic frames, is placed, upon, is placed on the patient's head. Then the patient goes to the CT scanner, at which time we obtain a stere what's called a stereotactic CT, a very detailed CAT scan of the head within the frame. The reason why we do that is we can then target the globus pallidus internus in what's called stereotactic coordinates. And let me see if I can describe that. Basically, the preoperative MRI scan, which has the detailed uh, internal anatomy of the brain, can be merged computationally on the intraoperative workstation with the CT scan and that gives us exact coordinates compared to the frame because the CT scan includes the frame. So the so-called X, Y, and Z coordinates, meaning the right, left, and down uh, coordinates are used to generate a point in three-dimensional space that corresponds to the globus pallidus internal segment. So we know exactly then, based upon this frame, exactly how to place the electrode precisely into the target structure. And the type of accuracy that we're looking at in the brain is extremely important that we're sub-millimeter accuracy. Um, all of these structures are pretty small, so we have to be exactly in the right place to get the electrode in the right place. So what I've just described is the principle of stereotaxy, which is what we use for placing things very carefully deep into the brain. And that is the use of the external coordinate system, namely the frame, along with the brain image, namely the preoperative MRI scan, to accurately target deep structures